was in the Reagan administration. We saw a member of the Texas Workforce Commission right now, past chairman of the Republican Party, and a well-known national conservative. He is what I call a Reagan Republican. And I think he's going to have very interesting remarks for us today. Uh, I respect him a lot. He has what Solomon had. He has wisdom. So anyhow, I'd like to have Tom come up here and give your attention. for not giving up the fight. We haven't begun the fight yet. We're going to take this country back. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, I uh, before I get in, Joanne asked me to talk a little bit about a few of the initiatives we put in place uh, in Austin at the Texas Workforce Commission. I'm going to talk about those and then talk about uh, what I've been discussing a lot on radio stations, not just here in Texas, but across the country. Uh, in the wake of the recent election, uh, the topic is conservatism dead. And, and if not, then how do we put it back together and reclaim, rebuild uh, that Reagan majority or a new conservative majority to get this country back on the right track? And I talk a lot about that in, in my book, Bringing America Home. I guess that's why they, they wanted me to discuss it. But first, I just want to say I really do appreciate what uh, Senator Eltoff recently did uh, in legislation he's introduced uh, in Austin. And I saw that both Joanne and Ashton commented on it. Uh, but I uh, talk in my book about the importance of term limits, uh, and, uh, and I was glad to see, uh, quite frankly, I think uh, I've been down there four years, I'm leaving in February, but I really do believe uh, it's important to have term limits in our state as well. I think there's a risk of people being down there too long and you get insulated. There really is a different mindset. I saw it in Washington, the next conservative revolution, quite frankly, is not gonna come out of Washington but I've seen it in Austin. There's almost a disconnect, if you will. And so I think it's time, really, for uh, term limits for our state elected officials as well. And I think that, uh, unfortunately, you know, the, the, the legislators won't put it on themselves. So I do think Senator Eltoff was right to, to make it for the statewide elected officials because maybe they'd be a little more open to uh, doing it, at least taking that first step. But I. I'm one who, uh, both having been in Washington and been in Austin, uh, seen the value, if you will, of, of term limits. First, I want to talk a little bit about what some of the things that we've done at uh, TWC. Joanne, in particular, in particular, wanted me to discuss a pretty innovative approach, and, and, and it's uh, been applied to many manufacturing companies, been applied uh, uh, to uh, some uh, uh, military, uh, some national defense agencies, but uh, it's called a Lean Six Sigma project. And so we put one in place. It's uh, really designed for efficiencies in government and it's applicable across the board. And the concept was uh, uh, through the Workforce Commission establish a pilot program applying the principles of Lean and Six Sigma, which is widely used in the private sector to one of our agency's programs with the goal of improving the efficiency and quality of operations while reducing costs. And we did just that with the Work Opportunity Tax Credit Program without getting into all of the details. Here's what we found uh, by putting this uh, system in place. A 48% decrease in the number of days to process determinations uh, when people were, were, were filing through the agency to get a decision. A sustained increase in the number of determinations issued each month, a 60% decrease in total backlog to process existing applications uh, from about two, five months to two months. It was a bogged down process. A 45% increase in the number of the applications that wound up being approved. So it was very effective in terms of productivity. And I say this because when I was in the Reagan administration, I was on the White House Council staff and then later headed a federal agency called Action. I'm proud to say we defunded the left, eliminated about 20 million bucks uh, in 1981, and it was going to Solovinsky groups, ACORN groups all over the country, a whole network of our tax dollars being used to fund the left, the termites who are eating away the foundations of this, of this system and of our country and of our traditional values. We defunded that in the four years I headed Action. We cut the budget by 25%, the bureaucracy in half, and did more with less money. But towards the end of that four-year period, Ed Meese asked me if I would implement uh, the Grace Commission report. And I don't know how many of you may be familiar with Peter Grace and the Grace Commission report, but 
a whole group of people who were outsiders with business experience came into government, looked at all the agencies and departments, came up with efficiencies and ideas as how to streamline government, again, do more with less. And uh, Ed wanted, uh, Ed Mees wanted to implement it and asked me to uh, take it over. Unfortunately, we were a bit of a divided administration, particularly towards the end of the, the first term and Jim Baker and Dick Garman, who were not necessarily part of the Reagan faction, uh, but nonetheless had enormous influence, decided they didn't want to get anything done. But there is a good example of something that uh, uh, people uh, were able to do in terms of putting great suggestions together, but it never got implemented. And I would suggest, uh, and I know many of you have been in and out of Boston, one of the things that's really jumped out at me, there are plenty of areas that we ought to take a look at down in Austin, uh, because you've got limited resources, and let's make sure those are productively spent. And I really think that we ought to have something akin to the Grace Commission in Texas. The difference is we need to implement it uh, once uh, you have uh, the group of people coming in and taking a look at what's going on down there. A couple of other things I, I, I quickly want to mention before I get into the main topic that I want to discuss today. And that is uh, two things jumped out at me when I came back in the government, and I've been in the private sector and business since leaving the Reagan administration. One was, um, I saw the returning veterans. I was in and out of DFW airport all the time, and I saw the returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan, and I, uh, the good news is, unlike the Vietnam situation, I was in Vietnam in 1969, came, uh, came out of service, wound up in Oakland as a civilian, and then uh, got on a flight uh, from San Francisco to come back to Texas uh, my home, and uh, even though I was in civilian clothes, I'd signed to be a civilian again, nonetheless, with my short short hair, it was clear that I was uh, part of that group uh, coming back from Vietnam, and I was welcomed in San Francisco airport uh, by a group of protesters who had everything from baby killers to all kinds of negative comments. There was a tendency, if you will, particularly for the hard left, to blame the warriors for the war. And consequently, particularly in the 70s and the late 70s, you had this really uh, a radical group that tried to, uh, if you will, call us everything from drug trade cycles to guilt-ridden victims, when most of us who served in Vietnam uh, were proud to have served, wished we'd fought it differently, didn't care for the Magnamara policy, and would do so again, even under the circumstances. And so we put together in the Reagan administration a program called Vietnam Veteran Leadership Program, run entirely by those of us who had served in Vietnam. And uh, we had guys, and men and women, generally men back then, <coughs> uh, help our fellow veterans who were underemployed, unemployed, or had lingering problems uh, with their Vietnam experience. And it was a remarkably successful program. President Reagan really welcomed our Vietnam veterans back the right way. And to give you an example, before the program started, there were a lot of people reluctant to put on their resumes that they'd served in Vietnam, and by the end of the program, there were people claiming to have been in Vietnam who never uh, uh, never got out of the States, or in some cases, never even were in the military. But nonetheless, we really changed the mindset, and I think the attitude and, uh, of, of, of many uh, of the American public towards the service of our Vietnam veterans. I thought to myself, the good news about the situation of those who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan we don't have, whatever our policy differences, we don't have this sort of tendency to blame the warrior for the war. There's a respect for those who serve, but there's a real shift in coming back. It's a, it, a dropping in from a situation where it's 24 seven and you're in Iraq or Afghanistan, all of a sudden you're making your transition to civilian life. So the first thing I did when I got down at the Texas Workforce Commission, and, and I, uh, well I, res I respect and appreciate the service of those who were in Iraq or Afghanistan, they're younger, their experience is different, so I thought let's put together a comparable program, and we called it the Texas Veterans Leadership Program, run entirely by those who served in Iraq and Afghanistan to help their fellow veterans make a successful transition to civilian life. And we've helped two, uh, 10,000 today, we've got uh, returning veterans all over the state, and just like Texas is the number one state to do business, it really needs to continue to also be the number one state for our returning veterans. And, I'm really pleased that we've been able to, to put that program in, pass, in place, a modest program, and guess what, just like we did with the Vietnam Veteran Leadership Program, we're gonna sunset that program uh, when the need is not there, and, and we're getting pretty close to doing that as the latest deployment comes back. And the final program that I wanna mention briefly is the issue of uh, 
of our Texas Back to Work program. We got a lot of people who were unemployed when we got hit in Texas like other states. And the thought was to take people who lost their jobs through no fault of their own and provide incentives to businesses to get them off the unemployment rolls and get them back to work. And so we have done that to the tune of about 30,000 people and the benefit is it saves money for the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund because rather than paying unemployment, you're providing minimum assistance to, for on-the-job training over a four-month period of time. Then the people are back to work. We've helped over 30,000 people do that. The irony is uh, we were trying to get uh, the, the authorization uh, to extend that program. It's no cost to our Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund. It's a win-win for the employers and for people who have lost their jobs through no fault of their own getting back into the system. And the irony is the Obama administration, even with law that's been passed by Congress allowing, it to do, allow us, allowing us to do that refuses to give permission or put rules in effect because that takes away their centralized control over the Department of Labor and over the individual uh, employment uh, operations around the country. I mean, this is just a small example of what is going on day in and day out. But let's talk a little bit about the issue that uh, I think as I is I talk to people all over the state and talk to friends around the country. I mean, uh, in the wake of this election, uh, there's been a real sense, if you will, um, both because of the presidential loss, four more years of the most liberal regime in American history, the loss of an opportunity to win back control of the Senate, uh, some defeats in the House that shouldn't have been there. Uh, there's been a real sense of despair on the part of some people. Clearly, you're involved. You're, you understand that we can't give up the fight. But a lot of people are, feel, are fearful, if you will, uh, who expected a different outcome. But they're tempted to believe that perhaps conservatism is dead. And that's what we're hearing. We're hearing it from the mainstream media. And we're hearing it from a lot of Republicans. And ironically, uh, the Karl Rolls of the world who spent an incredible amount of money this last time and very little to show for it, are now saying, well, we need to intervene more in the primaries to make sure those right-wingers don't get nominated in the first place. That's the problem. Uh, what they're trying to do is persuade us, if you will, to lapse into a sense of despair, that there's no reasonable prospect of putting a new conservative majority together again. That's what they're implying. That's what we're being hit with day in and day out. And that our choice is simply either to abandon our principles if we hope to win elections in the future. And of course, my reaction is, why are we in this? If not to advance our principles, if not to get the country back on the right track, not simply to hold an election like a student body election, isn't it nice that our people got elected versus the other people got uh, getting elected? Or simply to retire to the sidelines and accept the inevitability of the decline of our once great nation, now governed, as I said, by the most liberal regime in American history. You know, I've heard all of this before, and I mean, I date myself a little bit, but I was a young Texan in Washington, D.C. at Georgetown University. 1964, I was a junior, and I, would, I got a call that early part of that summer, would you like to come up and work in the Go Water for President campaign? And of course, I did, and I jumped at the opportunity. Uh, our conservative stalwart, Barry Goldwater, one of the first books I'd ever read was A Conscience of a Conservative. Uh, was running for president against LBJ. Very difficult set of circumstances with the assassination of President Kennedy, uh, with the depiction of Barry Goldwater's extremists, et cetera, et cetera. But in that race, we suffered a devastating defeat. In fact, uh, working up in Washington after the result was over at the Republican National Committee, I was given the assignment, this was well before the internet and instant results of calling around the country to the Republican State Party offices and getting the results of elections in their states. Uh, I was still pretty young and I heard some cuss words that I hadn't heard uh, before as I called around and announced I was from the Republican National Committee trying to get the results and it was white. And I learned, uh, if you will, uh, that there you go again. I mean, because right back then, conservatism was declared all but dead. It was buried by the mainstream media. And many of the Republican leaders, the Rockefeller crowd at the time, which had been so dominant previously, were saying, never again can we let these conservatives get in control. And guess what? 16 years later, and it took a long time, and quite frankly, we don't have another 16 years to wait in the situation we're in today, but 16 years later, the man who was the most inspiring voice in that campaign, Ronald Reagan, was nominated, elected president of the United States. 
and put together a coalition of Americans. And we weren't just against Jimmy Carter and against the failed policies of the Carter administration, but Ronald Reagan brought a team of outsiders to Washington with common sense solutions to the serious problems facing our nation at the time. And we built a conservative majority. So don't let them tell us or tell you that conservatism is dead and we've got to compromise our principles in order to ever succeed again. We don't have to do it. We've got to outsmart, outthink, outwork, and put a team of people working together in order to get this country back to, to, together. Quite frankly, there's too much of loyalty to politicians. When I worked for Ronald Reagan, we were loyal to him, but it was because of his principles. And we were a team of people. There were young ones like myself, much younger then. There were entrepreneurs. It wasn't the big business boys. It wasn't the guys that wanted pay to play, if you will, or to exercise influence. It was people that were concerned about what was happening to our country and concerned about their children and grandchildren and the future of this nation. And we worked as a team and we put common sense solutions together. And guess what? It turned this nation around and, and it, it, it paved the way, if you will, for the potential of a long-term conservative majority. And for many reasons, as I discuss in my book, Bringing America Home, it fell apart, conservatives lost control, the Reagan Farm Club were wiped out by people who were totally committed to pragmatism. And the sad thing about pragmatism, uh, if that's your principal objective, is ultimately it doesn't work. There's nothing wrong with being pragmatic to advance your principles, but when you're pragmatic just in order to get a deal done, then I'll tell you, that's when it goes off the rails. And I sure hope those Republicans in Washington don't make a bad deal. I say simply, no deal is better than a bad deal for the country. <laughs> President won the White House, uh, one of his favorite terms was, we're going to Washington to drain the swamps. And we did a pretty doggone good job of it uh, uh, back then. But the swamps are a lot worse today. I don't need to tell you that. And I don't need to tell you uh, the serious problems uh, of facing our nation. But let me just review a few of them, because I think we've got to know where we are and what we have to address if, uh, if we're going to fix things. Uh, we got a stagnant national economy, little private sector job growth. Texas is a remarkable exception to that rule. The hollowing out of our U.S. manufacturing base, a decline in our medium standard of, the, of the living, insecure borders, unsustainable federal budget and trade deficits, a serious threat posed by radicalism, quite frankly, a threat that I think, because it is theological at its core, that may be more serious, is more serious than what communism was. And finally, the coarsening of our culture, which may be the biggest threat of all, because no matter what we do to fix the economic problems we have and address the threat of radicalism, if we don't fix the culture, everything will be for naught. And I think we've got to do all of that together. Uh, to borrow a phrase from my old boss, Ronald Reagan, status quo is Latin for the mess we're in. Uh, but um, also, in fact, in my book, I quoted in the first chapter to, again, uh, from uh, Will Rogers this time, if stupidity got us in this mess, then why can't it get us out? And unfortunately, I think that uh, stupidity seems to reign, continue to reign today. But what they've done, I think, is Washington policymakers have made a bad situation worse as they focused on short-term fixes to keep the music going rather than long-term solutions. And if we're going to start pulling together a majority of Americans again, we've got to lay out a long-term set of goals, set of objectives, set of specific policies get, that can win the majority back. Let me cite a couple of examples when it comes to economic problems. Federal Reserve policies of Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan and his successor Ben Bernanke have kept interest rates artificially low in order to, quote, stimulate the economy in the short term. And yet, from a long-term perspective, these policies have fueled the credit excess of a bubble economy which ultimately resulted in the Great Recession of 2008 with the bursting of the mortgage debt bubble. I predict the government debt bubble is the next one to burst. This is already unfolding in Europe as we speak and will be on our shores in the not too distant future. Not only have the Greenspan-Bernanke policies of artificially low interest rates been a failure, 
but they've had a devastating impact on savers, particularly retirees, who are getting almost next to nothing in interest on their principal in return for all that they have tried to save and put away throughout their lives. What the Fed is doing is a distortion of the free market system by rewarding a favored class of creditors while taking money away from savers. A second example of what I call crony capitalism is the policy of bailing out the too big to fail financial institutions. The former president of the Kansas City Fed, Thomas Honing, has said that if they are too big to fail, they are too big. And I say amen to that. Many Americans mistakenly believe that this policy originated with Secretary of Treasury Henry Paulson in the Bush administration. As I point out in my book, Bringing America Home, it actually started with Clinton's Secretary of Treasury, Robert Rubin. A number of Wall Street firms had got on the wrong uh, side of the Mexican peso trade, and Rubin came in and bailed them out so that the credit derivative traders got paid and effectively 100 cents on their dollar. Then <coughs> Paulson, in 2008, effectively did the same thing. And the example is, think back to Enron, which was a bankruptcy and a failed enterprise here in Texas. At the end of the day, Enron wasn't an energy company anymore. It was an energy credit derivatives trading company. And guess what happened when it went bankrupt? The folks on the other side of those risky credit derivative trades got about 15 cents on the dollar. But under the bailout of 2008, and AIG is a classic example, taxpayer money was transferred, 80 billion in that case, to bail out U.S. and European financial institutions so that all of those institutions got hold. They got 100% on the dollar on their risky credit derivative trades. By the way, Goldman Sachs, where Henry Paulson had come from, and by the way, Robert Rubin had come from Goldman Sachs before that, uh, Goldman Sachs got $13 billion in that transaction. Taxpayer dollars goes to AIG, a uh, former board member of uh, Goldman is the new chairman for a brief period of time of AIG, and then immediately it's transferred to the U.S. and uh, European financial institutions. Uh, I, I mentioned in the book, uh, in this $80 billion uh, transaction, I call it uh, privatization of the gain and socialization of the loss. Uh, if the risky trades work out, the credit derivative traders get all of the winnings. If they don't look, work out, you put it on to the American taxpayers. And that's precisely what is happening yet with Dodd-Frank, and I don't know why our folks in Washington don't complain about it. What you've done is simply, in addition to all the complicated rules and regulations which hurt many of our smaller banks, in addition to all of that, they extend the number of financial institutions that are too big to fail, or they get included, if you will, in the future of the status of bailing out institutions that are too big to fail. And I would suggest this practice must end. No more bailouts of the too big to fi fail financial institutions in this nation. So let me talk about a few of the solutions, if you will, to the problems that I see out there uh, on the economic front. Because I think, I, I think back to uh, our days in the Reagan administration and the president came to office, one of the first things we did was the Kemp Roth Job Creation Act. It got bipartisan support. My friend, the late Congressman uh, Jack Kemp, had a great expression. He, he liked to, and he borrowed it from Jack Kennedy, but it was a rising tide lifts all boats. And he said, you've got to grow, the president understood, you've got to grow the private sector in order to pay for our government benefits and services. So we put in place in the first year of the Reagan administration, the Kemp Roth Job Creation Act, got the economy moving again, got people back to work, got unemployment down. Now the circumstances are different at this time, but the principle is still the same. You've got to figure out in a fundamental way how to grow the private sector. And let me point out what, I don't know why we haven't emphasized it to a greater degree. We have the most onerous business tax system in the world. We have a 35% corporate income tax rate, a 7.65 employer portion of the payroll tax, and I call it upside down economics because debt is deductible and rewarded while capital investment savings and employment are punitively taxed under our current tax system. So guess what we've been doing? We've been exporting prosperity and exporting American jobs overseas with this most onerous corporate tax system in the world. And the irony also is we don't have a level playing field with our trading competitors. 
From 2001 through 2010, we lost one third of our US manufacturing jobs. That's five and a half million generally good paying manufacturing jobs that were shipped overseas, outsourced, or simply went away. And I would suggest that one of the main reasons, in addition to the excessive amount of regulations, one of the main reasons for this is the kind of tax system we have. And let me give you a specific example. US made Cadillac here in the US, trying to compete in Germany with a Mercedes Benz, and let's just say, comparable price level of $50,000. That Cadillac is shipped to Germany after, of course, having to pay a 35% corporate tax rate, 7.65 employer portion of the payroll tax. Shipped to Germany, it's hit at the border with what they call a border-adjusted consumption tax of 19%. So price to sell at $50,000, we're at a 19% competitive disadvantage with the, with the Mercedes-Benz in Germany. The German vehicle coming into the US, we have no border adjusted consumption tax. We have no, uh, if you will, uh, uh, they don't have to pay our corporate taxes or our employer portion of payroll tax. And by the way, they get a credit, a 19% tax credit against their, uh, uh, against their business consumption tax back home. So what I think, and this is not my idea, David Hartman, a brilliant businessman who ran manufacturing companies, been in the uh, bank business as well. David had said to me a number of years ago, Tom, we're losing our manufacturing base. You've got to have a strong manufacturing base for a strong economy, and you also need it for national security reasons. I mean, do we want to be in a situation uh, where with all the manufacturing going overseas, we've got a critical part that we need for national defense purposes. And by the way, uh, we ask our friends in China, uh, would you please uh, make sure we get adequate supply of that at a, at a moment of crisis? We don't want to be put in that situation, and that's the way we're headed. The irony is, even a high-wage nation like Germany has a strong manufacturing base and a manufacturing trade surplus while we're running massive trade deficits, and I would suggest it's because we're on average at an 18% tax disadvantage with our trading competitors. The irony is the solution is relatively simple, if not easy. Just get rid of this existing system, pull it out completely from its roots, and go to a system that will reward investing in America. Eliminate the corporate income tax, the employer portion of the payroll tax, and replace it with a revenue neutral, business order adjusted business consumption tax. So all goods and services coming into the US pay the 8% tax, all companies exporting get a tax credit against their business consumption tax back home levels the playing field with our trading competitors. All that money that's parked overseas could come back into the U.S. and as long as it's put in capital investment, you'd be allowed to expense it against revenues. You've got an incentive, if you will, to invest in America. And suddenly you change the dynamics from rewarding, if you will, debt and penalizing equity to rewarding equity investments here in the U.S. And I think that we've got to be bold and I, I think we get into this trap of arguing over 2% you know, of on the individual tax rate, the reality is we've got to bring jobs home to America, we've got to rebuild our ma manufacturing base, and we've got to lay out a bold plan that can attract broad-based support. And I would suggest to you that most Americans realize, just like those of us who are older, I remember when I was a kid, and I was proud to be able to hear it was made in Texas, made in the USA, and that was the norm, not the exception. And it's become the exception, but that doesn't have to be. Change the tax system, bring the jobs home to America, rebuild the manufacturing base, and let the Obama liberals explain why they're not for manufacturing, why they're not for jobs here in the US. And this is where we're, I think, failing because we're getting trapped into letting them frame the debate. And we're always on the defensive or trying to explain our way out of it. Let's change the terms of the debate and go to the issue of how we bring jobs home to America in terms of tax and regulatory policies to get this economy moving again. Now here in Texas, and I know I've been talking about some national issues, but there are things we need to do here in Texas. I think one of the things that struck me when I came back into uh, the government, I've been in the private sector since leaving the Reagan administration, when I got back from Vietnam in 1970, I was appointed to the National Advisory Council on Vocational Education, and from 70 to 75, I served on that, on that board. And then it was sort of a given that, you know, there's validity to vocational education. It's important at the high school level and also post-secondary school level. And there's validity to college education. We need both. 
We need career ready, college ready. We need the options for young people that are interested in vocational education. I came back into, uh, in, into government uh, four years ago, and all of a sudden the idea was everybody's supposed to go to a four-year university. No child left behind. It means uh, we're all supposed to, all the kids are supposed to go to college. Well, what do you do to the 70% of the kids that aren't going to college? We neglected and denigrated vocational education. We wiped it out of a lot of our high schools or because you've got this four by four curriculums that's so restrictive and so oriented towards everybody going into the university. It's kind of, I call it the one size fits all education approach here in Texas. And the guy behind it, who is driving education policy, is also the architect of No Child Left Behind, which doubled spending in the Bush administration, the Bush-Kennedy bill, and now has been extended even more with the, by the Obama administration, moving towards centralized control of education in our country, and again, kind of a one-size-fits-all approach, as opposed to recognizing what we were trying to do, let's wherever possible, return power and the money uh, to the states and the local communities over our education policy. And in fact, we failed to get that done at the time in the Reagan administration, but at least we tried to move the power back to the, to the states and local communities. Well, the irony here in Texas is we have the architect of that, Sandy Kress, who is a former liberal, liberal Democrat uh, uh, Dallas County chairman when I was active in the uh, conservative movement in Dallas, and, and Sandy was an advisor to George Bush and, and uh, continues to have enormous influence. But we have an educational policy driven by someone who really doesn't reflect, I think, kind of a common sense approach to ec uh, education, which recognizes that there ought to be multiple pathways to a high school degree. Kids are different. They're not all designed to go to college. I had one son, for whatever reason, he didn't like sitting in the classroom, but he loved working with his hands. And it's great to see, as I've gotten around the state, a lot of these wonderful vocational programs that are out there, and kids who weren't interested, who didn't see the relevance of education, they start working with their hands, and all of a sudden the light bulb goes on. Now I know why I have to have math. Now I know where I have to have basic literacy skills. They start doing better, they do better academically, and they come out of school with a skill. Do you realize the average age of a welder is 55, the average age of a master plumber 56, the average age of a stonemason and craftsman is 69? We're choking off the workforce of skilled workers, and there's a grain workforce out there, and who's gonna take those jobs? And what we've done is we've neglected, almost denigrated vocational education at high school level. Uh, by this kind of, everybody's gonna go to a university approach, and we're losing a lot of kids who wind up dropping out of school, and if given the opportunity for vocational training, I think would have done very well. The good news is, there are a whole bunch of people coming together, uh, Republicans and Democrats, educators, business leaders, even labor, who are saying, this doesn't make common sense. So I'm hopeful that beginning uh, in January, we're gonna see major educational policy change which recognizes the value of local control and also at the same time recognizes kids learn differently, have different aptitudes, and we need more emphasis on career and technical education. A couple of things I want to mention I mean, that, that disturb me. I mean, even here in Texas, a good friend of mine put together a wonderful program at the University of Texas. It was a Western Civilization program. And I have, a, in my book, I talked about how Stanford once had a Western Civilization program and many years ago, Jesse Jackson led a group of demonstrators out at Stanford. Uh, and the theme of their demonstration as they marched against the Western Civilization program was, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has to go. Unfortunately, they were successful. Uh, but at University of Texas, I was so pleased to see what Rob Coons had been able to do, put together a marvelous Western Civilization program, which was even uh, written up favorably in the New York Times of all places. Well, the leftist professors down there didn't like it. And guess what? They got it dismantled, even in a state like Texas. Now, just the other day, I called Ken Hans, and I, I wish Lois Koch was led a fight to do something about it, but unfortunately, uh, she wasn't able to get broad enough support to do anything to get UT to reverse its decision. But just the other day, Ken Hans announced that he uh, was putting together and had raised money for a Western Civilization program at Texas Tech. So I'm Woo! glad to see Western Civilization is back in Texas. And another thing I want to mention that, that disturbs me, and I'm going to talk more about it after I leave, but 
I don't know if you realize that if you saw the other day, um, the Obama administration gave out some grants and awards. Uh, one of them was for $30 million. They call it the Harmony Schools. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but it's run by the Gulen uh, movement. Uh, if you read the New York Times and uh, Economist uh, magazine, not exactly right-wing sources, uh, the, the fellow that heads that movement, it's an Islamic uh, force that has, is very connected with the Islamist government in Turkey, which has pushed out the sort of the secular forces in that nation. Uh, they have in Texas a number of charter schools, and they get over $100 million in our state tax dollars, and it's foreign-owned, foreign-controlled, a lot of the teachers and the contractors, by the way, come from Turkey. And I am very concerned, as you read more and more about the Gulen movement, that we here in Texas uh, are, are, are allowing our tax dollars to be used uh, to uh, uh, push a force uh, which is not, uh, not in tune, if you will, uh, with the values we want, to, uh, uh, we, we want our kids to aspire to. And I know they're very, uh, very smooth in how they go about uh, do, doing this, and they do good things in math and science. But I really think we've got to take a very hard look at that movement, and a very hard look at whether uh, our tax dollars ought to be going uh, to the tune of 100 million plus to fund uh, and expand those operations in the state of Texas. In Georgia, there have been serious problems raised with regard to audits there. And there are concerns that have been voiced elsewhere about the, the goal of the leader of this movement. And again, I just wonder why we sort of let things uh, drift along in our state, along uh, without taking a hard, uh, hard look at, uh, at some, of those, uh, some of those issues. Um, I, I want to talk uh, just a moment or two about, um, uh, if you will, uh, where we are. Uh, and I know this sounds silly coming out of the recent election, uh, but I'm more encouraged uh, as I leave the Workforce Commission than I was when I came in four years ago. Uh, I saw what happened in 2010. I, thought, I saw what you were able to do. You know, I was happy to help a number of the conservative challengers uh, in 2010 who were running for office. I'm proud to see that they've done very well down there. I, I was so encouraged this primary season in uh, the Texas legislature see a lot of good people get elected. And I think stick to their principles, learn to work together, learn to form a team, learn to come up with good common sense solutions based on our conservative principles to facing our state. We're in the process of rebuilding that farm club that was decimated in the post-Reagan period. Secondly, I think the American people are way ahead of the, of the political elites in sensing the seriousness of the moment and the willingness to do the right thing and to be bold. We can't just sort of tinker at the margins. The problems are too serious. We do need fundamental change and not of the sort we're getting. And what troubles me is uh, you don't beat the termites on the left. I mean, they're, they're in day in and day out using government, using our tax dollars all the time to advance their cause. You do not beat them with people who are simply concerned about election or re-election. And I think that we have got to be serious about putting a team together all across this nation again, and that's why I'm encouraged. I mean, Paul Ryan, I talked about the business consumption tax. He has offered uh, uh, support uh, for that concept uh, to change the way we tax business, and he's been, uh, he is among many, many conservative leaders out there, and I hope, I hope they're, they're not uh, bullied, if you will, or not, uh, so scared that they simply go along with a bad deal because of the arrogance of this administration. There's no mandate for Barack Obama. It simply was a campaign in which they focused all the attention on attacking Romney, attacking the Republic. And by the way, and I was doing commentary the night of the election for an Austin TV station, and I see exit poll flashing, which says the majority of the voters felt that Barack Obama and the Democrats better represented the interests and concerns of the middle class than Mitt Romney and the Republicans. That tells me something is wrong. Because when we were involved as conservatives, and I think back to even with Barry Goldwater, he said, I'm not here to represent big business, big labor, or big government. They all got plenty of people to represent them. I'm here to represent the forgotten Americans, the middle class taxpayers and families who don't have lobbyists in Washington and aren't looking for loopholes in the law. 
And if we have got to get back to that principle because we had it in the Reagan administration, we've had it in the conservative movement, and it's a mistake, if you will, to allow the Hollywood left and a bunch of elitists, most of whom, I think there are fewer people in this administration who ever worked in the private sector, right. ever worried about having to write a check, as so many of us had as small business men and women, uh, to employees and not write a check for yourself because there isn't enough money to do that and you want to keep the business going. They have no sense, no care, no concern. No. And we make a huge mistake in not letting the American people know what an elitist group of leftists is in power and how disconnected they are, just like the McGovernites, because this is the McGovernites gone even farther to the left in power today. And it's to our peril that we let them frame the debate on this issue and this position and other positions at a time when the issues are with us and the opportunity is there to put a majority back together. Uh, you know, after, after the election, I, I, I went back and read an article I hadn't read in a long time. Uh, it was by Charles Malick, and he was writing in the conservative papers about the challenges to Western civilization. Interesting man, he was a Christian from Lebanon. He was ambassador uh, to uh, uh, the United States from Lebanon. And, uh, and he was uh, very strongly committed to uh, putting policies in place to win the Cold War, defeat the Soviet Empire, and defeat and wipe out communism. And I, I, I thought of that because as I, I read his article, he talked about the problem at the time uh, was you got too many leaders who uh, uh, see where the crowd is going, rush to get ahead of them, tell people what they want to hear, and, or, and then declare themselves leaders. He said, that's not real leadership. And here's what he said in the challenge of Western civilization, Ambassador Malik, quote, if Western civilization goes down, it will only be because its leadership has failed to show it the way. There's no impersonal law of growth and decay here at work whatsoever. There is the very personal moral failure of the leaders to show the way. And a real way out, most certainly there is. The actual ready potentialities of this civilization in every sphere are so tremendous, so overpowering, that with the proper coordination and the right, right voice of leadership, it can rise to any challenge. The greatest danger today is that either this leadership is not forthcoming or its voice will come too late. Let me read that last sentence. The greatest danger today is that either this leadership is not forthcoming or its voice will come too late. Now he was writing about the challenge of the Soviet Empire. And I was part of an administration with the president who had the will, the political courage, and a strategy to win the Cold War and defeat the Soviet Empire. I gotta say, when I was young and I believed in it, but I didn't know in my lifetime we'd see the Soviet Empire come unraveled as it did. And it didn't happen automatically. It happened with the right leadership. So don't despair. The problems are different, the threats are different, the needs are different, but the opportunity is there. And authentic leadership and, and the grassroots movement of people who care about our country. Look, I've, I've had a great life, but I don't like what I see on the horizon for our children and grandchildren. And there's some folks in our generation who simply say, well, you know, it's all lost, nothing I can do about it, I don't have to worry, I'm not gonna be here that long. Well, what about all the people before us who made possible for this to be the greatest land in the world? And we got a responsibility, because we helped get our, not us, but much of our generation helped us get us in this mess. And we gotta put the pieces back together, we can do it. And it's not a matter of, of who, but it's gotta be us. And it's got to be a group of people who are willing to say, uh, we're going to take the nation back, community by community, state by state, and put a majority back together who will get this nation back on the right track. Thanks for all you do. Let's keep up the fight. Don't despair. The fight has just begun. Thank you.
Okay. Do you believe the people in aggregate of the U.S. are sovereign, or we, the people of the states, are sovereign? Please elaborate. Well, I mean, I, I believe the people are sovereign. I mean, I think that the principle of the of federalism in the Federalist Papers is that uh, wherever possible, power needs to be devolved from the federal government to the states, the local communities, and the people themselves. It's called the Tenth Amendment. I believe in that principle of separation of powers, checks, checks and balances. Um, I, I'm not quite sure the distinction you're making uh, in terms of the people and the states because uh, you know, I, my view is that, um, you know, that, that what we've seen happen, and it's happened both with the rise of executive power and the uh, unelected federal judges who have essentially wiped out the power of the people and the, and the states by rendering decisions, whether it's the Roe v. Wade decision or taking prayer out of schools or other issues, which quite frankly could be fixed by Congress legislatively, by simply wiping out the, the rights of the, the states and the local communities to make those determinations for themselves. What do you think the Fed, of the Fed creating $45 billion out of thin air will eventually do to our dollar? Um, gold and silver are good investments. Uh, no, this is terrible. I mean, this is, um, and I talk about it extensively in the book, I mean, they are setting us up for uh, a situation at some point, the government debt bubble is the next bubble to burst. I've written extensively about it, and it is a, it's a disastrous policy, and why we continue it, and why there are no voices, uh, not enough voices out there uh, uh, critical of it is baffling to me, because the people at the grassroots level have a better sense of it than the, the Washington policy makers. I think uh, both Greenspan and Bernanke have been disastrous, and, and quite frankly, Greenspan's uh, artificially, keeping interest rates artificially low, fueled the credit crisis that led to the first bubble bursting, and Bernanke's doing the same thing, and at a certain point, uh, the dollar's going to lose um, a great amount of its value. When that'll happen, I don't know, but continuing the policies uh, is a guarantee it will happen at some point. I think we just had, I had Martin Hutchinson, who I recommend you, you a, a Brit who uh, is a uh, become an American, a conservative economist, speak at our Texas Workforce Annual Convention. And he, um, he's a conservative economist, and he believes, in fact, he calls for right now, you've got interest rates that actually should be at four and a half to five percent. Now, to go from zero to four and a half could create too much havoc at the moment, but he, his view is move uh, monetary policy immediately to two percent and then slowly move it up. He said at 2% you clean out a lot of the Wall Street crud that is there. It's totally only successful because because they keep an interest rates artificially low. So I think it's a disaster. Why did Mercedes-Benz build a giant plant in Tuscaloosa, Alabama to make SUVs and sell them in the world? Um, well, uh, you know, uh, Toyota is doing, you know, Toyota has also come, come to Texas. I think, here, here's what I think has uh, happened. I mean, the, uh, first of all, as an international company, they have ways of, um, of making sure they don't have to pay the 35% corporate tax rate uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, I think, here's why I think U.S. manufacturing can really come back. Number one, our energy costs are lower than any place in the world. And so it helps us be more competitive even though our labor costs are higher. Uh, secondly, the cost, if you will, of shipping goods from Asia or Europe to the U.S. is a significant cost. Um, and, and, and so there's a real advantage of having it here in the U.S. Uh, third, they were able to obviously come in and not have a lot of the legacy costs of some of the, uh, the U.S. automobile dealers. But the reality is that uh, anybody, to my knowledge, uh, all of the U.S. automobile makers that are trying to compete in Europe or Asia, they make their vehicles over there. They don't make them here and ship them overseas because of the, of the tax differential, which is so, uh, so dramatic. As I said, on average, it's 18%. In China, it's 17%. In Germany, it's 19%. In the EU nations, it's on average 21%. So I think there's a real opportunity to get uh, manufacturing back. 
because you've got uh, real-time inventory issues, you've got shipping costs, you've got the problems that took place with the tsunami in, uh, in Japan where it, uh, it led to uh, a lot of essential parts that, uh, 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 in fact, I think a, a plant in Mississippi couldn't get essential parts for a period of time. So there are a lot of things going in the favor of rebuilding our manufacturing base, but I think the only way you make that happen in a significant way is by changing this distorted tax system, uh, which uh, is a disincentive to capital investment here in the U.S. In fact, in 1986, in the so-called Tax Reform Act, which uh, uh, I, I, I don't think was, I think it was a mistake, uh, but we got rid of the investment tax credit at that time, so there really aren't incentives to invest in America and changing the tax system to a border adjusted consumption tax and eliminating the corporate income tax would do that. The Muslim backed schools will eventually begin turning our children against this country. How can we prevent this? Well, I think we've got to look very closely at uh, whether taxpayer dollars ought to uh, uh, ought to be used. I have I have real concerns, and I, I think uh, there are all kinds of issues. And I know some some of my friends in the legislature are going to try to craft legislation to do something about it. It's a real problem, and uh, when you're using our tax dollars and you've got a very questionable organization that's in charge of that group, and where does the money go? Uh, these are nonprofits, but sometimes can be profitable. And why do you have to have so many Turkish teachers come in on these visas? when there are plenty of uh, young people here who uh, would love to teach. And why are the contractors uh, Turkish as well, in many cases? So I think this is a significant problem that's been underreported. I like your words and thoughts in assuming that we can survive until 2016. I'm interested in your comments about Sarah Palin. I like her. You know, uh, what I like about Sarah is nobody's got their hooks into her. I mean, she speaks her mind. Uh, and I just think, um, you know, it's very hard. I, I mean, it's hard. I try to tell, I try to tell the young legislators going to Austin, uh, um, look, you get down there and after a while it, it gets easy to cross over a line and start compromising your principles and it's awfully hard to, uh, to move back across the line once you do it. So I, 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 I like Sarah Palin. I mean, I think she, you know, the media elite can't stand her, but look, I, I think without her, uh, four years ago on the ticket, uh, I think it would have been a much worse situation. So I, I have a high regard for it. Do you see and I, let, me, let me add something. I think, what, I think she has a, a, and again, I would differ on certain issues and certain approaches, but she speaks from a conservative populist standpoint. And that's really the future to put back a conservative majority. A populist approach that appeals to disenchanted Democrats and independents as well as Republicans. You know, we heard the term Reagan Democrats. Well, that was, that was coined by folks in Michigan who were blue collar workers who went with Ronald Reagan because he, he was concerned about the issues they, they were, jobs, the economy, uh, traditional values. So I, I think she really understands this better than a lot of people on our side. Do you see a competent leader in the wings? I think there are a lot of good people. I mean, I, I, I'm encouraged. I mean, Mike Pence just got elected in Indiana. There were a lot of good people. Ted Cruz uh, got elected here. I, I think you just got to build that farm club, bubble it up, but rebuild a team. The danger is, you know, and this is what's kind of struck me, even in Texas, coming back into government, there's no conservative team. There are a lot of good people around the state, but it's not like what we had in the Reagan era where all, you could go anywhere in Texas or anywhere in the nation and you had sort of the Reagan leadership group. And I know you all are trying to put that together, and I think that's critical. But without a team, we lose. And, and even some of the people who are conservative, they get in office and it becomes about them, and not about, uh, about building and, and building a farm club. That's why I'm glad to see some of the new legislators who were elected two years ago, helping other people. We all gotta help one another. We do not be big money establishment folks who have their agendas, uh, without a team of people working together. How do we educate the general electorate effectively regarding the imbalance of trade and manufacturing which is negatively impacting those voters' jobs? Let me tell you, I think it's there. We just had the wrong candidate, I hate to say it, but you know, Mitt Romney made his money uh, look as a private equity firm, which is very different. I was in the venture capital business. Venture capital is investing equity into a company. Private equity is really 
blow the companies up with debt, and it's game in the system, but I can understand it because you've got a 35% tax rate, blow the companies up with debt, downsize them, you know, do a few things, and you've got a lot of debt, very little equity in it, and you can flip them in a few years, and the risks are low, but uh, I, I just don't think he was the right person to carry the message. I mean, Rick Santorum talked about it, uh, this uh, last presidential race. I think that he didn't have, you know, he hadn't thought through the solution. What do you do to, 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 to put manufacturing back? But I think the American people are ahead again of the political leaders in sensing we better do something. We better bring jobs home to America. So I don't think we have to so much influence the um, American people as the inside the Beltway Republicans. Okay. Thanks for being here.